weekend, Jeff, uh, we'll be talking about breaking the power of things from our past. And most of us have things from our past that either we did or were done to us that we wish we could just forget. And we try. But often, it's like we're tied to all of that stuff. Dragging it around with us even though we don't want to. So sometimes, followers of Jesus need to be reminded of what he did when he hung on the cross, when he came to us, carried our guilt, our shame, our failure. He gave his life for ours, amen? And with that, there is forgiveness, there is grace. The past, your past, is done. As for you and God, it's clean. White as snow, white as snow. We must not forget this. I think in part, this is why Jesus instituted, instituted something called communion. And this is something we do. It wasn't to start another church ritual. It was to be a vivid reminder that the bread, his body broken, the cup, his blood shed, also that I can be washed clean white as snow. What we couldn't do, Jesus, our Savior, did for us as he exchanged his life for ours. That means whatever your mess is in Christ, it's been washed white as snow. And scripture says this, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. This is what communion is to remind us of. Like a fresh snow that covers all the gray, all the dirt, all the dismal, we are washed clean from our past. And I'm sure some of us need that reminder today. So as we pass out communion, Usher's gonna come forward and pass it out. And we're gonna sing a song. I want you to think about this. Think about, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So if you follow Jesus, please join us. If not, don't feel pushed to do this. This is something we do as, as Christ followers. For those of you who do join us, hold on to the cup. Hold on to the bread. We're going to sing, and after the song is done, we're going to take communion together. So, Father, we remember, remember now that through the blood of Jesus, we are washed white as snow, washed clean. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you for that forgiveness and that grace. We love you. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus.
after I read this, Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread now in remembrance of his body broken for us. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink it now and remember the blood that was shed for us. We remember, Father, and we thank you, and we worship you because you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, our Savior, to not only die on a cross for us, but to rise again to conquer death for us, God. And through that sacrifice, we we have victory, God. And we remember, we remember it now. So thank you, thank you, Jesus. We know that whatever weapon is formed against us, whatever storm comes crashing in our life, you are there. When we're mourning, when we're hurting, you are there. And we have the victory, God. Tonight we have the victory through you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing this together. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper.
Friendly, shake a couple hands next to you, then have a seat. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all. Don't they do a great job leading us in worship? I tell you, I feel like we have the big time right out here in Podunk. Yay, that's awesome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you're here. My name is Jeff, and I'm so glad you're with us. We'd love to have you fill out a connection card. I don't know if that's me or... Is that me? Let's see if it stops. Now we'll, we'll pray or something, all right? So um, anyhow, glad you're with us. We'd love to have you fill out a connection card. If you're newer here, no pressure on that. But if you do fill one out, you take it out to the information center out in the lobby and give it to them. They have a nice gift for you if you'd like it. If not, that's fine as well. Now, I'm going to ask the ushers to pass some cards out, and um, I would like to ask everybody just to take one, unless you've filled one out already. Just take one. You don't have to fill it out. You don't have to do anything with it. You can just th throw it away or leave it on the chair, whatever, but just take one. Go ahead, guys, and just pass them right out real quick. And I've, I've been talking about this for two or three weeks, and the reason, and we handed these out once, and the reason I'm doing it again, if you were here and you say, well, you already handed us one, is because this is like the end, all right? So... We invite our church family to join with the larger church worldwide during the season of Lent, which is from Ash Wednesday next Wednesday. So this is kind of like the last hurrah on this thing, all right? That's why I'm talking about it now, because I'm really not going to talk about it past, you know, the services this coming Sunday, and then, and then I'm done talking about it. But from Ash Wednesday next Wednesday through Easter week, we invite our church to join with the larger Christian church in saying no to something. Now, we put a little twist on it. We call it Fast Forward Week, challenge you to say no to something and a yes to something. In my life group this morning, I'm talking with the guys just saying, what are you guys saying no to? What are you saying yes to? And this is a great thing to do as a life group. Talk to each other about it. But if you want to be a part of this, and you don't have to fill this thing out, trust me on this, you don't. But if you want to be a part of it, fill this thing out, and um, you can drop it in the offering basket, which goes by in just a moment. Or I think we're going to uh, put some... Put a couple tables out, Stace, in the lobby with buckets on them, if we can, please, so that they'll be at the end of the rows. All right, thank you. So they'll be there. They're just not there right now. And and uh, you can drop them in there. And there's just something about joining together. So I've talked about this this year. I'm saying no to desserts, and I'm saying yes to taking some time mid to late afternoon just to make a connection with God. So the idea is disciplining ourselves, 
to, to say no to something which we need and discipline ourselves to say yes to something which is, which is good for us, draws us closer to God. So I'd love to have you do that if you want to. Again, I'm just doing it because this is kind of it, and then we're done talking about it. So we're going to worship God now by giving our gifts of tithes and offerings. Ushers, if you want to grab the baskets and bring them up. Let's say thank you to all of our ushers. They've worked hard tonight. They pass out offering and, and communion and cards and everything. These guys do a great job. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll give. God, thank you so much for your blessing in our lives. We lift up the requests over on the wall, God, for the broken places in people's lives that you would move, and by your Spirit, people would see the victory, see what you bring. We trust you to do that. And now we give our gifts and we do it with thankful hearts. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, amen. Emotional behavior is largely involuntary. I can't believe that. We have certain basic emotions which are controlled subconsciously. Notice your own emotional reactions. What did you feel? What did you do? Under control, your emotions can make you healthier and happier and improve the lives of people around you. This is pretty clever. That's a rather simplified suggestion of a complex mental process, but you get the idea. I want to say welcome to everybody in Dalton, blessings on you guys, and in Middleville, blessings on you guys, and everybody joining us online as well. And welcome everybody to week three in this series called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Now, this material is based loosely on a book of the same title, which I've said for the first three weeks, and I'll stop harping on that now. But we have that available at the Next Step area at all of our campuses if you would like to purchase that. That book has had a significant impact on my life. This material has made uh, a, a big difference. And really what this is about, what this series, what we're talking about, is about growing from the inside. Growing ourselves on the inside, which I think most of you probably wouldn't argue with me on this. It seems to be kind of the polar opposite of what we get coming at us all the time in the world around us. Because everything's talking to us about how we, you know, how we look, how, what makeup you do, what you do with your hair, how, what you're eating, how you're eating. It's all about like the body. It's all about these things. In fact, I don't think I'm stretching it to say our appearance between our clothes and, and, and hair and makeup and all the things that we're, it's all being pushed. I think it's almost been elevated to like a God-like perspective. It's like that is supremely important in the world around us these days, in our culture. And yet that is actually where Christians take a different path. They, they diverge from that. They, they move in a different way because what they understand is that really what we're called first to is we're called to grow our first focus should be growing on the inside. It's not just what you eat. It's not just how you look. It's from the inside. Jesus said it this way at one point in Mark chapter 7. He said, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. So the saying you've heard, you are what you eat, Jesus is basically saying, really, it's not true. It's not the stuff that you eat. It's not the stuff on the outside of you. It's not your body. Rather, he says, it is what comes out of of a person that defiles them. So it's the stuff you do, it's coming out of you from the inside. And what Jesus is clearly saying is, he's not telling us to ignore our bodies. He's not telling us that it doesn't matter what we eat or how we look. It's, all that stuff's fine. What he's communicating is, start with the inside. You work on what's going on in you. And this has been my contention through this series, and on this, this is week three on this, that too often we're so intense. We're, we're busy working on the outside, and we're not bothering with what's going on in here. But everything you do, all that happens in your life is coming from inside you. And what defiles you, what does damage in your life, is the stuff from the inside. So in week one, you know, I talked about the idea that we shouldn't settle. We have this stuff happen in our lives. And too often what we're doing, instead of addressing these things that are going on in us, instead of growing up and maturing, we just basically numb out. We ignore them. We act like it's not there. We, you know, we, we get caught up in escapist activities and spend hours gaming and avoiding dealing with or thinking about why this is happening in my life. What is really going on? And my, my thesis was basically don't settle for a life skimming the surface. I mean, you can do that. Lots of people do. 
But we're called to something better than that. And then week two, I talked about the fact that we do have these things in our lives. But too often what we do is instead of really addressing what's happening, we do behavior modification. You know, we try to make ourselves, I'm going to act different. I'm going to do different. I'm going to be different. And what we don't do is we don't become what I call self-aware. We don't have essential self-awareness. We don't go underneath. We don't do kind of the deep dive and say, okay, what's, what's really happening? What is the catalyst for this behavior that I can't seem to stop? I'm trying to modify the behavior. It's not working. What's really going on? And both those talks, if you did not hear them, you know, you can, you can get them online at our website or use your favorite uh, podcasting app and just search for Thornhill Valley Church. The talks are worth hearing, I think, because this stuff matters. The author says in this book, basically, that so many people, they, they spend years in church, and it's like they say they're followers of Jesus, but it's like they never grow. We don't grow on the inside, and that's because often what we do is we just numb this stuff. We just ignore it. We just shy away from it. So what I want to talk about this week is very important, and it really, I mean, what it comes down to is who you are is very much impacted by where you come from. We'll be talking about family, what's called family of origin. Where you come from, what happened, what was in your family. What, and, and, and talking about how do we address those broken places because all of us experience them. And this, is, this stuff will be great for group conversations. If you're in a life group, man, you ought to talk about this if your group talks about the sermon uh, uh, that w- happened that week. And if you're not in a life group, you should consider it. Sign up. Go out to the next step area at your campus and talk to them about that. So, so if you've come to TVC, you've probably heard me talk about how I think church is really important. I think people need to be a part of a church, and they need to go to church, and they need to do it consistently. I really believe it's important. But I'm going to give you a true confession, all right? One of my sweetest memories of a time with my dad is when we played hooky from church. Now, this is not typical for me to tell a story like that, all right? But actually what happened, I, it's so long ago, I can't remember now the, the, uh, the situation, the circumstances behind it. But for some reason, my older brother Rick and myself and my dad stayed home. My mom and my younger brother Dave went off to church. And what happened during that time when we were playing hooky was so uncharacteristic of my dad. It was unbelievable because what we did was we got into a paper wad fight. Now, what I mean by a paper wad fight is where you take a piece of paper and you roll it up real small and then you bend it over and you have a rubber band. Anybody ever done that? And you put it like a slingshot and you pull it back. And this was, my dad never behaved this way. And we, I don't know how we wandered into it, but it became a full-fledged war. I mean, there were blasting, you know, advances where we were just charging, screaming at each other. There were strategic retreats. There was pleading for mercy when somebody was right over you like that. You know, I, this, get this. It was so crazy that my dad was acting this way. It was like this incredible experience. And now, this has been over a half a century. Yes, I'm that old. And I still have that picture in my head. I can see my dad leaning out behind his recliner like this. It was, a, it was a wonderful and amazing experience. Honestly, uh, my dad's passed away 23 years ago. And I, there, I had plenty of good times and certainly quite a few good memories of my dad. But I'll be honest with you, and some of you have been around long enough to hear me reference and talk about my dad. For some reason, with all the good memories I have, the darker or painful ones seem to overshadow those. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I, 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 have, I have good memories. I have some great memories of dad, but the dark ones, they seem to overshadow. I can remember with such vividness my dad looking at me and saying in anger, this happened multiple times, you will never amount to anything. I remember his anger, his 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 intense anger when he'd come home and things weren't just perfect and how he would yell at us and how he would look at us. And, and though I have these good memories, and I can remember playing with dad and shooting paper wads and how much we laughed and how fun it was and how wonderful, it somehow seems, and I don't know why this is, but the dark ones seem to overshadow the good ones. I don't know 
really, honestly, I don't know why it is. Maybe it's because when you get wounded, it, it opens you up and it leaves a scar and there's something vivid there that, that, that you touch that, that comes back to you, whereas sweet memories are just that, they're memories. And so maybe those things, maybe because of the scars it overshadows, I don't know what it is, but what I do know is that I carry very memorable scars from father wounds. Now, what that meant for me was that even as a young man, I said to myself, I will not let this happen in my life to any children that I might have. And I was dead serious about it. In fact, I remember when our firstborn, our son, came into the world, it was such an amazing thing. And I remember afterwards, I wasn't, it was after I'd left, I was driving away from the hospital, I think, maybe he and, the, and, and, and Ann were still in the hospital. And, and I remember thinking to myself as I was driving, I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to love you, and you are not going to get the kind of pain that I had when I was a kid. I vow it. And now I look back, and I know that I didn't keep my vow, that I wounded his heart in different ways, along with all of his siblings, all six of my children, and that which I swore would not be passed on amazingly, in some ways, went from me on to the next generation. And I think you all know what I'm talking about because I think you have experienced some of that. Truth is, everybody has father wounds, and I'll tell you why everybody has father wounds. You can say, I had the best dad in the world, but he wasn't perfect. Come on, is that true? And so there's just going to be some. My kids don't carry father wounds of physical scars that I remember anyhow. They don't have any of those, but they have emotional scars. And we think, we think, I am not going to pass that on, but here's the thing. Research shows, actually, that we do more often than we can imagine, pass that stuff on. You say it's not going to. It's not going to pass from what I experienced. It's not going to happen. And then somehow it does, which Scripture actually validates. There's an interesting verse in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 14. It says, the Lord's slow to anger and abounding in love and and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet, yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And he punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, you can read this in one of two ways. You can read this as how unjust, how unfair that God would see that punishment would happen to children who are innocent, who weren't responsible for that behavior. Or you can read it as I read it, which is God saying, you understand, don't you, that you have a choice in how you live, but when you choose wrong, it isn't just you that gets wounded by your wrong, that it actually travels from family to family, and it is absolutely generational. And so we carry these things that we say, I will never take this with me. I will never do this. I like what the author of the book I referenced, Pete Scazzaro, says. He says, Jesus may be in your heart, but Grandpa's in your bones. (laughs) And it's true. You can say, I'm not going to be like my family. I'm not going to be what they are. I am not. And you run away. You can run to the other side of the world. But when you turn around and look back, there's grandpa. And mom and dad and whoever else were involved in your family. Because this amazing thing happens with our family of origin. This, the families, however it looked like. You could have been adopted or a foster child. Or you could have two parents or be, come from a single parent family. Whatever it is, you carry some of those things that happened in your formative years with you. And it happens. And it happens to all of us. You look through history, you can see it in history. You look through the Old Testament, which you will see multiple generations like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And what you will see is the sins of the father. And Abraham, you see lying, running away when there was trouble. You see favoritism. You see go from father to son to grandson. We'd like to think that it doesn't happen But it happens. I mean, it totally does. And what this series is about and what this talk is about is standing up to this stuff that can tear us up on the inside and really addressing it honestly. So I thought I had this idea. We'll see how it goes. I'm not sure. 
But I had this idea, maybe we just maybe put into this talk kind of some real honest conversation in real life about how this happens in family. So I thought maybe I would use my family as an example. And so I asked my, my eldest daughter, Bethany, would you be willing to come and talk about this stuff honestly? And that's not easy to do, but she said yes. So would you welcome my daughter, Bethany Graham, to the platform, please? Wow, like you're getting like people hooting and hollering for you. That's, that just doesn't seem fair. My own kids. Yeah. Thank you for coming and doing this. So um, you heard all this, and we've already talked about this. Actually, it's raised quite a bit of emotion in both of us, really, when, when it comes right down to it. But um, y we already know that you take stuff from your family of origin, which <laughs> is your mom and I uh, and, and the home we cre created, and you take mm -hmm. that now into your family. You have three children, and you're married, and you're trying to develop your family. You see that. So I want to talk honestly about it. Let's start by talking about just a couple good things. Could we do that before we yes. get to the bad? Yeah. Just to help me. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I loved growing up in a big family. <clears throat> I love growing up a pastor's kid. Um, and I, I grew up knowing, knowing that family is important. And um, we had many weird traditions that were, to me, special. Then when I talk about them, people say they're weird. Um, for example, whenever we would have, like, a big work project to do, my mom would call it a party. So, like, when we had a pool party that was, like, digging out a to, foundation. To put the pool in, uh -huh. yeah. Um, like corn parties. I remember corn those. Corn party, freeze the corn. We had so many parties. And I might have complained when I was a kid. But I'll tell you what, I do them now with my own kids. And, um, so that was a good thing. I, oh, took. yes. Yep. But that was your mom. So is there anything? It was her. Okay, so <laughs> back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, like, you really raised us all to be very independent, to kind of solve our own problems. You've always had this like, independent personality. Um, and you kind of raised us like you can do it. You treated us not like little kids, but just little people. Uh, like when I turned 16, I got my license. You were like, there's a shiny, new, I'm sorry, I mean a rusty old Chevy Nova <laughs> out in the driveway. Hey, and it like, ran, all right? It did. It was amazing. I was thrilled. And you were like, it can be yours. Oh, by the way, it's a stick. I know you don't know how to drive a stick, but we'll like figure it out and you can drive it around. And I feel like you maybe took me out one time. Um, so, yeah, and it was the kind of stick where you had to push the clutch all the way to the floor to get anywhere. So I stalled out every intersection in Barry County and like three to six months later, I was doing okay. But you put that faith in me. And I feel like that really laid a foundation for me to feel like I could solve my own problems. I could figure stuff out. You treated us all kind of like that. Like, here you go, figure it out. Um, even when it came to following God, you know, even though we were pastor's kids, it wasn't this situation where we were forced to be Christian, forced to do Christian things. It was, we're going to model this, we're going to do some of this together, but you're going to make your own choice. And I always really appreciated that. So, um, th those are good things. Thank you. Do you want more? I had one more. One more? All right, yeah. one more. Yeah, why not? Yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, I really, when you ask me to think about good things, the biggest thing for me is I felt like as a kid, knowing you were a pastor, you kind of did all this preaching. I genuinely felt as a kid and still now, like I had parents who practiced what they preached. And you hear so much about just two-sided people, people who act one way at church, one way at home. And I really didn't see that. You know, I had a dad who liked to make like slightly inappropriate jokes, fart jokes at home. He did the same thing at church, more or less. Um, so that's one of the good things? Yeah, <laughs> but it, you know, you talked about generosity. I actually saw that in our lives. You preached about committing to marriage. Like, we saw you go on those dates every single week. Um, you preached about just being intentionally loving to your family, about having quiet time with God, and I watched you and Mom, like, work at those things every day. It never felt fake to me. It's something that I saw on a daily basis. Yay, that's good stuff. Good Yay. stuff. Well... Hang on. <laughs> so, but you often will say, 
And I, th- I can thank you for that. You talk about things that you got from me. Yeah. I mean, I like to blame you for whatever, like, physical ailments I have. Because if I'm going to look like you, i got to be able to blame you for the other stuff. So <laughs> thank you for the weak stomach, the heartburn, the insomnia, the intolerance to garlic. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. But you also really worked hard at instilling in me um, just the importance of turning off the light when I left a room. And I thank you for that. Uh, made a big impact. Actually, it didn't. Ha. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's turn a corner. And uh, let's 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 talk about stuff that you see that came out of our family that you struggled with. Um. Well, I mean, start to start off in this open and honest conversation. I feel like a big struggle for our family was being open and honest with each other about our faults. And I felt like I knew that you and mom fought in your marriage because I heard you preach about it, but I didn't actually see it. I knew that you guys had individual struggles, like somehow I knew that was true, but I didn't see it myself or really know of it on a more personal level. So like... Like in the family, you felt like we didn't talk about it, just didn't get... Not a lot. So to give you an example, uh, some number of years back, I had had guests staying in my house, some extended family, for a couple weeks, and I was like totally over it and feeling guilty that I was over it, but, you know, just getting that Happy feeling. Happy to see them. You wanted them gone. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I saw mom around that time, and I was like, mom, how did you do it? Like, you were always such a gracious host. You had people stay here all the time. You had Grandma Sally live there for two years, my her mother-in-law. Mom. Yeah. And... I know that she complains sometimes and, you know, make comments or sometimes have a lot of needs. Like, you always were just happy and patient. How? And my mom just laughed, like, what are you talking about? I didn't always enjoy that. I just straight up walked out of the house sometimes. I was so frustrated. But the crazy thing is, like, I had no idea. Like, no idea. And so for years I was just beating up on myself, like, my mom always did all of this, and why am I, like, just not a kind, perfect person? And I never knew that maybe, maybe mom wasn't also, like, at the level I had put her at. So you, f- you feel like, you want to know the truth? I didn't know some of this before we talked. This is how you carry stuff you don't even know to the next generation. So, I mean, we sat in my office today talking about it. Both of us got a little teary-eyed. So you felt like there wasn't the kind of openness yeah. that helped you see reality. Yeah, and the irony is I see in myself now. I struggle with being open with my own kids, even husband, even though, like, I maybe wanted that more as a kid. It's still, it's not my instinct. My instinct is don't talk about the stuff that, doesn't feel good or feels like a failure. So the sins of the fathers move on. What else? So um, connected to that, I really, and when we were talking, we really realized our family has struggled a lot with not dealing with conflict directly. Uh, We did in the past. I think it's still a struggle. Um, so the positive here, and this is a huge positive, is we weren't a family of yelling. You didn't yell at us when we were kids, like, not hardly that I can almost ever remember. Um, siblings, at least as adults, we don't yell at each other. I can't speak to childhood. It's weird then. Um, you know, we spent a whole week in a house together, like all of us, all six of us and spouses and kids. in Colorado, yeah. And I don't believe there were any yelling matches, any big blow-ups. We're not one of those kind of families. We actually enjoy each other's company, and I think that's really special. But we are all human, and we're all very different humans, and we do irritate each other for sure and hurt each other's feelings. I know we do. And kind of our family tradition is instead of yelling or just directly stating the problem, we tend to just release that anger in like sarcastic jokes. Um, that we say are jokes, but they're not. I can kind of like, just so myself, for example, if someone, you know, a sibling or you, 
said something that hurt my feelings uh, or bothered me, I would probably first off say, it's fine, it's no big deal, and tell myself in my mind, like, I'm taking the high road, you know, whatever. But the That's truth is... That's because we don't talk about it. Yeah. So... And I wouldn't even admit to myself, like, mentally I was mad exactly. But I would be mad. And so instead of saying anything, I would just, like, when the opportunity arose to say something sarcastic, and again, a joke, I would do it. Probably more than once. And the hard part of this one for me when I was reflecting on this is that I realized I've done this to my kids. And I don't want to, but it's happened. So. Now that you're out of the will, is there anything else you want to say? <laughs> I got like two more. Two more? <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, another thing, I feel like I, maybe this is just the filter of my personality, but I took something positive and twisted it negative. I felt, I've always felt, I really do, that I had a wonderful childhood. But somehow the irony of this is that I turned that into this feeling that I had such a wonderful childhood. Like, why am I still such a screw-up as an adult? How I feel a lot of the time. You know, I thought when I was a young adult, so much of this verse, to whom much is given, much is required. And I just constantly felt like, you know, I looked around at my friends, the people around me, they were all carrying baggage, you know, family baggage. And I've always said to myself, like, I don't have baggage. I had a great childhood. So I have no one to blame my issues on except just me. And, I mean, I know it's a blessing to not have baggage, but I l allowed this to just create so much of a sense of, like, inadequacy and insecurity in me because I couldn't, I wasn't blaming it on you and mom. Um, and I feel like I, I idealized my childhood in this way that I wanted to be the best of my parents and do everything they'd done, you know, and more. But I'm just one person, and I'm not the same as either of you, and I'm more of you than mom, but, you know, she's a mom, I'm a mom, so I felt like I had to try to be like her, and I just fail and fail and fail. Um, even in small stuff, like when I was very first pregnant with Naomi, I was like miserable, sick. And I'd never paid attention to any pregnant person before that except my mom. And mom, when she was pregnant, was one of those like glowing, she loved it, living her best life people. I know, that's why there's six of you. It's a <laughs> and like, it was like instant mom failure because I didn't know at that time there was another way. And I just felt like, wow, I already, I'm already not doing it right because I'm supposed to love this, and I honestly didn't. So I've struggled with a lot of that. It's feeling like you, you don't measure up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's get to the last one. This All right. Is, uh... So last thing I have always seen in you, like, just a ton of ambition and drive. And you are a person... In me. Yes. And mom, too. Um, like, you've always wanted to do well at whatever you did. So, yes, your work in this church, but also, I mean, like, an exercise program or a household chore. Just whatever you wanted to do well. And we were definitely, like, raised in a house where hard work was, like, top value. And, you know, we were really taught, like, success can look different for many different people, but the foundation of success is always hard work, which is awesome. And I certainly, you know, have s that personality, and I have that same, like, drive, like, I want to do well at the little things, and I'm willing to work hard, little or big. But I've come to see that there's a dark side to that as well. I see it in me. I see it in you. Um, and it's just this struggle to be content with, like where you're at in your life at any given time. Because when you're always striving for the next thing and you're striving for more, it's exhausting to yourself and it's exhausting to the people that you love the most. And, you know, I look back like when I was a kid, I don't remember, you know, feeling judged or criticized by you or mom. But at the same time, I didn't want to share my faults and failures because I felt like we're a family that works hard and then we're going to do well and that's what we do. 
And I see that too now with my kids. I can say I'm not being judgmental, I'm not being critical, but sometimes when you have that kind of drive, there's like, like my kids, my girls can sense in me a critical spirit sometimes. And I hate that feeling, you know. Sometimes it's easier for them to go to their dad because he's got a much more contented disposition, less judgmental. So it's been hard. All right. I, I, I want to move quickly on this because I have a couple things I want to say after this, but what are you doing to deal with that? Um, I mean, first off, I married the most open and thrilled to talk about his own failures person that I've ever met. So he just knocks me down when I get to thinking I don't need to share stuff. And when I feel myself cringing inside, like, why do we need to share this? I'm thinking, okay, God, I guess I need this. I need him. I need my kids. So um, you're using the gift of the difference in your husband to help you deal with stuff yeah. that you drug into the family. Yeah. And I'm really working, again, against instinct at being more open and intentionally open with my family with some friends because I discovered that like when I just peel off that band-aid and just be honest about what I'm struggling with like the awesome thing is they can keep me accountable and they hear me when I'm starting to go down that I'm not good enough rabbit hole or you know trying to do things for the wrong reason especially my kids they're always there so I'm working on it there and uh, I'll just end with just kind of a story of a time that I felt God spoke to me. This was like nine, ten years ago. But I always go back to this when I'm feeling like I'm not good enough. It was just a regular day. I was outside with the girls. We were eating lunch up in their little fort, squished in there. Nothing special. For some reason, God just put this thought in my head, like, did your parents ever do this with you when you were a kid? I thought, oh, my parents never ate lunch with us in the backyard fort. Heck, Heck no. no. <laughs> You know, and I had been at that time in my life, and I still do sometimes, like walking around with this list, like you're not doing this, you're not doing this, this thing that your mom did, this thing that the Facebook people did, just a list all the time. And it was like God was saying, like, your parents didn't do this, this thing, and do you care? No, I didn't care. I didn't care at all. And he just spoke to me then and there, like, you can be the person I made you to be, not somebody else. And, like, that's who you're designed to be. And as a mom, that's who I can be as a wife, as a teacher, as a daughter. Like, all I have to be is just who God made me. And all this trying to be more of somebody else, it's just a waste of time. It's not God's plan. So I just go back to that. So, I didn't even know some of this. I would have said the thing on the work and the drive and the push. I would have prided myself on saying, we have a work ethic in our home and that's the way you do it. And I never even saw the dark side of it. And uh, Beth and I were talking about this before the service. That we're aware that some of you are sitting there right now going, girl, you don't know how good you had it. I had terrible experiences. Some of you were molested some of you are struggling with all kinds of issues from your childhood and and it seems like a wrecking ball in your life to this day and we understand that but I thought it might be good for you just to hear this is how and we worked hard at being a good family I mean Ann and I worked hard at being good parents you don't even know sometimes you're wrecking your kids because you take stuff from your background do you want to know a big part of why the work ethic is so huge because, and I'm still fighting this at 63, I'm trying to prove to my dad I will amount to something. Would you be willing to thank Beth for coming and sharing honestly with us? Thank you. All right, I'm going to do this quickly, but I want to just talk about, to me it's always important to kind of just look at some practical stuff and say, okay, how, how, what do I do with this? Because I'm aware that some of you are totally triggered right now. I, I'm aware of that. 
Some of you are thinking about it from a perspective like I was, sitting there looking back going, crap, crap, crap. Others of you may be thinking this is happening in my life. It doesn't matter where we're at. We all struggle with this. And so let me just give you some quick thoughts. All right? and, the, and the first one is, we've been talking about it, is I think this is one of those areas, again, where people just go, I'm not going to pay attention. I'm not going to, no. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be like my family. I'm not going to address it. And what happens is you actually, what you really do is you just bury it and it's still there. Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa's in your bones and you can't get away from it. And you have to, you have to acknowledge it. You know, it's interesting that Beth talked actually about some things that I would have said are good things on the one hand, and she's seen the dark side of them on the other. And the point is, is not to acknowledge the stuff from your past as either good or evil. You may determine those things but to be aware of them. Because you will bring them into your family. Like, be aware of how did your family dynamics work? Like, how how did you process conflict? Some of you came from, you know, you were the shouter family. You were the family that just blew up and yelled and blah, 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 and then everybody was done with it. Others came from a family more like apparently what Beth describing us as, that we just kept it low. We kept it down underneath. How did you... Because, see, th- I mean, this is a reality, and I think sometimes we, we actually miss this, that we, we, we catch these things. We get them from our family. And the reason you need to know these things, you, you, you need to know how did, you, how did you talk to each other? Because you carry that to the next generation. And the reason you should know that is, and I talked about this last week, you cannot change what you are unaware of. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't fully aware how my drivenness was damaging my children until years later. And I could go back to my childhood and say, I can see where it is. Because when someone tells you you'll never amount to anything, you just, you just, you're just going to prove them wrong. Well, see, it, 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 it doesn't work. So you have to first acknowledge it. The second thought is, and some of you, there may be only a handful of you here, in Delton or, or Middleville or wherever online, you, this one's for you. You need to stop being a victim. I don't know how to say this any more lovingly than this. Stop blaming your family for your problems today. Acknowledge that the stuff was there. But can I just be blunt with you? Every child is a victim. Every child. Because they are raised where, wherever they're at. From an orphanage to a loving home, they are raised by imperfect people. Come on, is that true? So every child is a victim. But you come to a place in your life where you choose, do I stay a victim or do I become an empowered person who realizes I don't have to live my life as a victim to my past? And sometimes I just, this is going to sound like a whiny old man, but sometimes I just get a little disgusted listening to people talk about, well, if my parents hadn't done this, just shut up. That doesn't sound very Christian, does it? But, But it's like sometimes you just go, Okay, yes, you're wounded. And you do need to acknowledge it. But don't stay a victim. Don't stay a victim. I mean, this, th- th- this is so important. Don't, don't do that. Stop being a victim and blaming you know, the past. You have to make some decisions on your own. And the best way to stop being a victim that I know of is that you have to release it. And this may be one of the bigger steps for some of you listening I mean, this, this, one may be, <laughs> this one may be huge for some of you. And what I mean when I say you have to release it is, is that you have to forgive your family. And when I say that, I'm immediately aware that some of you are going, if you knew what my father did to me, if you knew the things that my mother said to me or how she treated me or how she would slap me in front of people, how she would put me down, if you knew that, and I don't know that, and I hate that you feel that pain, but I'm going to tell you, that the best way to make sure that it is generational and it keeps going on is for you not to forgive them for what they did. Because when you don't, you just carry it with you. You carry it with you. And of course, this is what Scripture teaches us. This is what the Bible says, Ephesians 4.32, forgive one another as quickly and as thoroughly as God and Christ forgave you. And it is hard. It's what Jesus taught. Forgive us our sins. You know the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our sins. What? What? as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And the reason he gives us mandates like this, always, are for our good, not to torment us. You have to let your family go. Whatever the wound was, you have to forgive them. That doesn't mean you're going to forget it. 
It doesn't mean that you're not going to work at this for years to come. But you are just going to drag it into the next generation if you cannot release that thing. So you acknowledge it. You stop being a victim. You release it. And then I'm going to give you one more and then we're going to close with this. Just, and this is going to sound a little confusing. But I think, I think we have to learn in our homes, in our lives, in our relationships to start a new dance. Now here's, here's what I mean by this. And you will know what I'm talking about. When you get under pressure, when you get angry or frustrated or something difficult happens, the whole family will fall under, they'll go to their places and they will fall into a certain dance. And you've done it for years and it happens over and over and over and you hate it and you don't want it, but here's why it's so hard to stop. It's muscle memory. We don't even have to think about it. You get triggered, you get angry, and you go into the dance. You move into place, and, you, and your husband or wife moves into place, and the kids move into place, and everybody does whatever it does. It is that the family does. And here's what I want to challenge you to do. You can, you, I don't know how, how, how else to say this. This stuff is unbelievably hard to change. And it is a lifetime work. But one of the greatest keys that you have is if you make the decision... I have to change this dance. And so you start changing the first steps of it. You start going, okay, when this happens, I'm going to step back from this. This is what I'm going to do. And you will falter and you will fail. And this is what you need to do. You need to get back up and you need to keep doing it because you have a choice. You will perpetuate the sins of the fathers to the next, the second, and the third generation and on. Or you can break that. And it is hard. Oh my gosh. It seems actually impossible sometimes. I'm 63, and I already admit it to you. I still feel like I'm trying to prove to my dad. I can't even say it without... And he's dead 23 years. But it is worth working at. Anybody agree with me on that? It is worth working on. And with the help of God, there is freedom. At one point, Jesus said something that seemed so outlandish to people that, that they actually, their, their response was, how is that even possible? And this is what he responded with, and I think it's significant, and it applies to what we're talking about this weekend. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. We have to work, and we have to keep working but God can bring healing in our lives. Amen? It's possible with God. So at all our campuses, let's stand to our feet, and I'm going to pray, and then we'll be done. So God, help us to to honestly acknowledge where we see this stuff in our past from our family of origin to maybe we can't fix it right away, but to be open about it and honest and to stop being a victim by blaming others and just release them and then move on and and take some fresh steps. We need your help in this. And we trust that you will help us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, let's say together, all campuses, amen, amen. Have a great day. You're dismissed.